So hello everyone, my name is Michael, and um, today, as Perry mentioned, I'm going to be talking about DOS attacks and a little bit about DDoS attacks. Um, the purpose of this talk is just to give you an introduction of what they are. Uh, we'll try doing some basic DOS attacks at the same time, and then give you an idea of what the scale is when we're talking about larger DDoS attacks. Um, a little bit of credit. Some of the content on the slides uh, I've only been able to collect because of my employer, Cloudflare. Um, because some of the numbers are quite astonishing. Um, but hopefully, uh, you'll enjoy everything that we're going to talk about today. So before we actually talk about DOS attacks, um, a quick networking recap. Um, I talk about bandwidth, uh, data sizes every day, but most of you might, might not. Sorry, might not. Um, but uh, good to go over it. Then we're going to, as I said, code a few basic DOS attacks. Um, going to show you some pretty charts and some examples of what happens in the world, and then we're going to have a politically correct conversation about Donald Trump. <laughs> so let's start. Um, very basics, um, byte and bit. There is eight bits in a byte, okay? Um, when we talk about bandwidth, usually we refer or throughput, we usually refer to bits per second, bits per month or whatever, not byte. Uh, a lot of people get confused by this. And it's quite important to get them the right way around because uh, there's actually a factor of eight difference. Um, I often speak to many people, uh, they start talking about gigabyte per second, then maybe someone else is having the same conversation in gigabit per second, and then something happens and they realize they've just got their, their sizes wrong. Um, you should all be very familiar with kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, et cetera. Um, just to give you an idea of sizes, I checked the London Web Performance homepage. That weighs 175 kilobytes, so very good. That's very lightweight and fast. Um, BBC homepage is 4.1 megabytes, a little bit heavier. Um, that is only after you lazy, lazy load all of the images. In fact, when you first load the page, that's also quite, quite light. Standard DVD movie example, Blu-ray, and the hard disk I have on my laptop is about 500 gigabytes. Keep in mind those size ranges, because they'll come in useful later. Right, um, and if, like me, you're not good at converting things, um, Google has an amazing conversion calculator. And uh, if someone asks you, hey, what is this in bytes per month, whatever, type it in secretly, you sound very smart when you give them the answer. Um, last quick recap, um, network models. So we're going to be talking about DOS attacks. Some of the things that happen in a denial of service attack are at lower layers. Now, most people here would have been working with websites or similar, um, and that would be layer seven, HTTP, HTTPS, layer six, seven, if you include TLS as well. Um, some of the examples we'll be talking about today actually happen at layer three and four. There are different models around on how you can conceptually split up these layers, um, but we'll stick to the OSI model, okay? Right, let's actually start with a, with a denial of service. So what is a denial of service? Um, in essence, if you remove access to your application, uh, or better, you want to remove access to legitimate users to an application, that's a denial of service, regardless of how you do it. A lot of people think you need to overload the machine. That's not necessarily the case. If you find something that brings it down, you've uh, successfully accomplished a denial of service. How you do it is your choice. Why you do it might be, you know, you've got a different options. You might have a grumpy uh, e-commerce customer. You might have someone trying to extort money out of you. Or the worst case, which I've never seen happen that often, is distraction. A hacker might have actually got into your application. They perform a DDoS at the same time. You're focusing on keeping your app up and running. And the hacker is downloading your user database from, a, from another access point in your application. I do have an example of an extortion letter. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this kind of letter before. Um, usually hackers would use email, um, but surprisingly for this sort of stuff, sent by post is a lot more effective. Um, I've hidden the name of the customer here, or the target website. Um, if only the hackers knew Bitcoins weren't going to do so well, they may have asked for something else. Um, this is very common, and again, you see the Bitcoin address here, anonymous, don't know who sent it. And it essentially says, it's a Dutch, we're targeting a Dutch website here, essentially says, if you don't pay us this, we're going to do a DDoS and take down your website. Right, how difficult is it to actually perform a denial of service? Um, if you're lazy, you go on the dark web, 
you look for a link to a website like VDOS, you pay some money and someone will do it on your behalf. So extremely simple in essence. Um, this website is not online anymore. Um, however, we do think that over two years when it was online, it generated about $600,000 in revenue. So a lot of people used this sort of stuff. And I'm sure if you go to the dark web or you ask around, there's probably other similar services still online. But let's not be lazy. Let's try and, and do something ourselves. So I'm going to talk about floods, um, mainly because it's a well-understood problem and because it's quite easy to replicate. So a flood, when we're talking a flood in, in the DDoS context, is a way of you find a specific aspect of a protocol or an application, you try and hit that endpoint over and over again, you make use of that weak endpoint until the application goes down. You may have heard of SYN floods, uh, which are layer three denial of service attack, or more recently, HTTP layer seven is very common. Um, but let's focus a little bit on SYN floods. Right, um, I'm gonna explain to you how they work because we're gonna try one in a moment. Um, essentially, when you start an HTTP connection, there's a TCP handshake that happens underneath. Now let's pretend you have a client on the server. The client sends a SYN packet to the server. Servers receive the SYN packet. It will save uh, all the details of the client in what, what is essentially a queue, a SYN queue, okay? Keep in mind that queue has a limited number of spaces. By default on Linux machines is 128. It will then send a SYN act back to the client. The client receives that, says, I'm good. Sends, the client sends the act back to the server. Once the server receives the ACK, with the information that's stored previously in the SYN queue, it creates a proper connection and frees up that spot in the SYN queue. Okay? And then the connection goes to the accept queue, which is you know, when data goes back and forth and it gets delivered to the actual application. The other thing to note is if the client never replies after the SYN, SYN packet, the server by default Linux servers will retry five times. So before that space in the SYN queue is freed, usually about 30 seconds goodbye. Right, to do a SYN, SYN flood, uh, we need to, you know, there's various ways of doing this. I chose Scaffy, it's an interactive uh, packet manipulation tool. Uh, it works in Python, it's very easy to use. I know how to, you know, basic Python knowledge. I know how to use Google pretty well and SYN floods. I kind of understand SYN floods, so I, I gave it a go essentially. This is what the script looks like. Um, very quickly, I'm importing the Scaffy library. I'm creating an IP packet. The destination of that packet is my target machine, okay? Then I'm creating a TCP packet. The source port, random, doesn't really matter. I'm gonna target a web server, so the destination port is 80, and I'm sending a SYN packet, so the flag is S. Here we can see I'm building the actual request with a fake body over TCP over IP. And then I'm just, bombarding the server in a loop with a bunch of SYN packets. The other thing to note is if I do this from a target machine and the server sends my ax back, the operating system of my machine would try and reset those connections. So I also add a firewall rule on my machine to essentially not reply back from my attacking machine. So I'm just sending SYN packets. So <laughs> let's give it a go. I have, a, I'm gonna show you in a moment, I have a DigitalOcean instance and I have a web server. And we're going to see if we can uh, SYN flood the web server from my DigitalOcean instance. On the server, I'm going to be monitoring the size of my SYN queue. I'm also going to be monitoring the traffic incoming on my web server. And we'll see if we manage to send it offline. So bear with me as I try to find my mouse. So this is my droplet. Those two are the web server. And the other quick thing I want to uh, let you notice is if you all open quickly this URL in your browser or phone, hopefully it will load. Anyone can confirm? Oh, sorry, the actual URL. Um, it's LDN London Webperf, LDN London Webperf dot code dot com. Does it load? Yeah, so DDoS it now and send it offline. <laughs> Does it load? Yeah, good. Right. 
keep that URL in your browser because I'll ask you to refresh it in a moment. Right. So I'm going to find my mouse on the top. On the top, excuse me, it's a little bit far, but on the top one, I'm going to be monitoring the size of my SYN queue. There's 24 connections uh, initiating by the server. This is you guys trying to connect to the web server. That will go down probably as you stop refreshing. On the bottom one, I'm going to open a TCP dump. Let me. Right. Listening for SYN packets coming from my droplet only, so there's no noise in there. And now I'm going to start my script on the actual droplet, which is what I showed you earlier. And what we're going to see is we're going to see the SYN queue fill up, a bunch of traffic on the TCP dump. And then you're going to try refreshing the website, and we're going to see if we can send it offline. So the queue starts going up. It's filling up on the left. There's no app packets being sent by my, my machine. So that's going to fill up. It's full. No more apps being received. Can you try refreshing your browser? And hopefully, it won't load. It's cached. It's cached. <laughs> Damn it. Do a hard refresh. Does it not work? Could you please confirm it doesn't work? <laughs> Dead? Yeah? Great. It, it will load once in a while. The point is performance is degraded, right? Great. So I'm happy that one worked. I was a bit scared it wasn't going to work. Um, right. So at this point, I can start this again. Um, you should all be thinking this. Are you serious? Is it so easy to send a server offline, a web server? That's a production web server. A bunch of my websites are currently offline. doesn't matter. Um, does anyone know which specific SYN flood mitigation feature I disabled on the web server? Any clues? Besides my Cloudflare colleagues who might know. <laughs> no one? Um, surprisingly, even though we're not talking about HTTP, we also have cookies in SYN connections. Specifically, we have a thing that's called SYN cookies. What I'm going to do now is re-enable SYN cookies on the, on the server. And we're going to hopefully bring it back online. So I find my mouse. Right. I cannot read. Yeah. Right, I re enable send cookies. The script is still running on my attacking machine. In theory, now you see that the, the server is actually accepting a bunch of connections again. If you refresh your browser, it should be back online. Can someone confirm that happened? Yeah, loaded fine. Right. Now, how does that work? So it's, happened. it's the opposite way around. <laughs> The magic of live demos. Right. OK. So when a TCP connection in is initiated, uh, TCP packets have a sequence number. The reason they have a sequence number is TCP guarantees the order of the packets arrive in the correct order, right? While UDP, for example, does not guarantee that. Um, normally, the server would choose a random sequence number, send it over. The client will send a packet plus one, and so forth. When TCP cookies are enabled, the sequence number is not a random number, but rather the server encodes all the information about the SYN connection in that sequence number and adds a cryptographic hash and sends that over to the client. The client sends the ACK packet back, plus one. The server removes the, the plus one again, revalidates the hash, and can start the connection without actually ever using the SYN, SYN queue at all. So we've completely removed, with a bit of a hack, the SYN queue on the server. 
and uh, it works pretty well. Right, so problems though, like any DDoS mitigation you might have is it's not 100% bulletproof. Uh, sequence numbers are only 32 bits in length and the server cannot fit all the SYN information uh, in that sequence number. So some information is gonna be lost. And if you have a mail relay, for example, that customizes TCP connections heavily, you will still be affected by major performance degradation. Um, the concept of SYN cookies is quite old. Um, on Linux servers, and this is quite surprising, um, up until 2016, they were very slow to generate. And Linux server was only able to handle about a few hundred thousand SYN cookies per second, which sounds a lot, but SYN floods can be quite large. Since 2016, there's been a kernel fix, which allows a Linux server to handle several million packets per second, which sounds a lot better. However, if we look at the sort of DDoS SYN floods we see at Cloudflare, um, we're talking about 250 million packets per second, okay? This is a graph from November, and SYN cookies is definitely not sufficient to solve this sort of problem. Even if our SYN queue is way bigger on each server, it's about 16,000 compared to 128 on each, on each standard Linux installation. Um, so Cloudflare does a few, few additional things. In fact, we have a tool, a, a packet fingerprinting tool, which we call POF, it's open source, which fingerprints SYN packets, we get that fingerprint, we convert, convert it to what we call BPF format, which can be imported into IP tables. Um, and then IP tables can match against the fingerprint and just drop those SYN packets before the kernel starts thinking about initiating connections. Of course, we don't use an out-of-the-box IP tables. We use something a lot more custom than that, which we call Gatebot. Um, but that's the sort of uh, advanced mitigations you got to do when you reach that sort of level. Um, this type of DOS attack is a problem about packets per second, which your processing unit cannot handle. However, when you reach this size, you also have another problem, which is the bandwidth itself. Um, so if you think about earlier, I talked about 500 gigabyte is the size of my hard disk. This is another example, uh, which was 480 gigabits per second of SYN packets. That's equivalent to my whole hard disk being thrown at the machine every eight seconds, okay? So that's quite a lot of bandwidth to handle on, on a single computer. Um, again, there's no easy solution for this, except you just need the scale and you need you know, big machines and many of them to be able to absorb that sort of, of traffic. Great. Um, briefly, I wanna talk about another type of DDoS attack, which is amplification. Um, the first amplification attack was known as a Smurf attack. Essentially, you would send a ping, ping packet to a router um, with a spoofed IP address, the router would send that thing to all the nodes behind that router, and they would all reply to the target machine, uh, overloading the network and everything would go down. Nowadays, this doesn't happen anymore likely, it's very easy to filter out. But a more common type of amplification attack, which you may have heard of is DNS amplification. Um, it's very easy to generate a request which looks like a DNS amplification. It's over UDP, so you can just put a DNS request and the response come back and the response is much bigger. And then you can, of course, also spoof the IP address of your target. So the server can respond to someone else instead of responding to yourself. Um, I have an example of a amplification request. Again, excuse me as I look for my mouse. So if you do a dig to that, I'm not asking you to do this now, but if you were to do a dig at that domain, a uh, very small question, which results in a pretty big answer, something like this, okay? Which can be sent to your target machine. And this sort of, um, this sort of request is in fact about 50 times bigger than the actual, let me get my presentation back. Okay, so it's about 50 times bigger. So the amplification is about 50x, which is quite considerable. We're not gonna do a demo of this, otherwise we're out of time, but this is what an amplification attack would look like on SCAPI. Um, targeting a single machine and sending single requests from my computer. And um, these tend to be quite difficult nowadays because your home network usually, or your ISP would not allow you to send packets out of your computer pretending to be someone else. It would be filtered at the ISP level. I checked with my ISP, I use a little one here in London, 
they don't do this, so it was easy to test this from home. You can try and see what your RSP does. And you can ask me who I use later. Um, now, of course, you do need a list of DNS servers that do allow you to respond to arbitrary uh, targets and allow you to abuse their services. There's a lot of them out there um, in a lot of distant countries, of course. Um, you can see the number on the left, and it does sum up quite quickly. So um, there's also people that gathered lists of these open DNS resolvers, which you can use for DNS amplification attacks. Last time I checked, in about five minutes, checking the first website, there were about 30,000 uh, open DNS resolvers out there, which you could literally bombard and get DNS responses from. Some of them are very smart. Google, for example. If you do more than a few requests per second against their DNS servers, they will stop responding. Some others are not very smart at all. Um, if you do have a list, you can start building something a little bit more dangerous. This is exactly the same script as before, but instead of sending requests to a single DNS server, I'm loading my list of name servers, randomizing it, and then just sending requests out in a loop. Um, Ideally, you wouldn't do this from your machine. You would do it from a botnet. Now, getting a botnet is probably the most difficult part of doing a proper di distributed denial of service. And as an example, again, I didn't do this, but we're going to use a common, a famous example of a Wirex botnet. Has any of you actually heard about the Wirex botnet? No? So this was a big number of compromised machines. You can see the count on the left. On average, it was about 70,000 compromised devices, up to 120,000. And these were just doing random arbitrary requests, depending on whoever was controlling the botnet was wanting to do. How did they get hold of this botnet? Simple. Create a bunch of apps which solve easy problems. You may have noticed you cannot download videos from YouTube. Create a mobile app that does that. Publish it, even if it's not on the App Store. People will go off and download it. You can see there's a bunch of them. When people would install it, it would give you appropriate warnings. People usually ignore those, install. And then if you actually looked at your services running on your application, you'd see random services doing a bunch of different requests to arbitrary target machines. Okay, 70,000 people fell for this very easily. Right. Um, if you have the botnet, you know how to perform this request. You get your distributed denial of service. Um, I'm going to quickly close this up with uh, this slide before we talk about Donald Trump. Um, this is a visualization of source IP addresses of the botnet. And this is why botnets are very dangerous. Is you, you cannot rate limit on IP addresses as they are literally coming from everywhere, including um, reserved IP ranges. So sometimes they even do non-very smart things because those would be quite easy to filter out. But still, there's, there's a lot more. Donald Trump, right. Um, you all know about the US presidential election. Um, it was very interesting for us at Cloudflare because Donald Trump, as well as another 10 candidates, were using Cloudflare to protect their presidential election website. And we got to see some cool stuff happening against those websites. Um, this is an example of an HTTP flood attack. So if we look at all candidates, with the exception of Donald Trump, this is a number of HTTP requests being blocked in a single day. And um, it's a bit difficult to read, but that spike there is 200,000 requests in a single day blocked by Cloudflare because they were non-legitimate requests. Now, I'm going to show you the graph for Donald Trump. Right. It looks similar, except on the left, we're talking about millions instead of thousands. Okay, So this goes up to 15 million requests in a single day. I think if you average that out and across a, a whole day, you're getting about a few hundred requests per second. Of course, they weren't perfectly average, so it's pretty big bursts of traffic. And then if we overlay that with other Trump websites, uh, you find that the other candidates, which are also on this graph, are not even visible at the bottom. So he definitely got a lot of attention. Um, let's add some timestamps on these. Um, this is difficult to read. This is when he initially proposed the ban on Muslim Im immigrants to the United States. Um, this is a funny one. This is when essentially anonymous declared uh, Operation Trump. 
they essentially did nothing compared to what other people were doing. Um, finally, at the end here, this is when the actual US presidential election happened. Still a little bit of traffic, but definitely the big one stands out by, by quite a bit. Um, last slide. Um, if we actually looked at the traffic being sent, it was very dumb. It wasn't smart at all. Problem with HTTP plugs is there's just lots of them. They're difficult to filter out. Um, lots of vulnerability, lots of attempts of WordPress vulnerabilities, um, generic bots, SQL injection attempts, uh, all was a bunch of other things. The website was pretty static, so there wasn't much to, you know, uh, get access to. But nonetheless, um, a really large amount of traffic. Uh, with that, that's done for me. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? I, <laughs> the question is, do you think Cloudflare is responsible? Um, I was expecting that question. Um, I'll let you decide if that's the case or not. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> At least I'd like to think we're not. Um, but the website didn't go offline. There was one little um, problem the website had. I'm not sure if anyone noticed. Someone managed to insert emojis on Donald Trump's website. And there's a few interesting emojis you can insert in there. But besides that, um, the website stays online. Any more? Um, I don't see why not. I will double check if there's anything, but I think it's pretty, uh, even the Donald Trump is a public use case for us, so yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, if they're shared, they'll be on londonwebperf.org in the next few days, right? So I'll go from there. Any more? Right, hold on. Are DDoS attacks uh, seasonal? So, like, there's obviously the notorious script kiddies and stuff like that. So, do you see during school holidays peaks in or around Black Friday or? Um, they, so there's different trends. Um, definitely the smarter DDoS attackers, especially the ones sending ransom notes, um, they would attack when IT staff, especially IT security staff, are not in the office. So, they do tend to be around weekends. Um, Christmas holidays, etc. If someone is really trying to get a lot of money out of the company, they will try and attack during Black Friday. For a large e-commerce company, going down during Black Friday is pretty much a whole year ruined. Um, the other thing we've noticed is there's actually some organized, um, let's not call them companies, but groups that do this as a job. And we have another graph that shows, uh, you know, once they select a target, the DDoS traffic actually is exactly matching the work hours of whoever is doing that attack. Because someone is paying them nine to five, attack that website, starts at nine o'clock, five drops, and then the weekend is quiet. <laughs> so, a bit of everything, really. Anyone else got a question? Yeah. Okay, I'll come. There's two on this side. So. So there was a paper last year about this special new kind of attack. Maybe not that special, but we've seen everything. But there's this thing called um, tail attacks. We just try to push up like tail latencies, but makes it really difficult to detect. And it just like has these like small bursts of traffic, but still, you know, makes the site kind of less mm -hmm. responsive. Do you kind of offer any sort of protection for that? Or have you heard about this? Or um, so, opinions? yes, uh, we, in fact, we, we, again, I couldn't, I don't have all the graphs here, but we, we had one that was called the porcupine attack because the graphs looked exactly what you were explaining, big spikes of traffic all of a sudden. Um, the, the landscape of DDoS is evolving and most DDoS attacks now are what we call layer seven. So we're on the application layer. There is no silver bullet to protect against, you know, DDoS attack, be it Cloudflare, be it Akamai, be it, Fa be it whoever. Um, it is all about having visibility on the traffic and customizing your platform for that specific case. Um, so there are many things that can be done. I guess the only thing that you could get guarantee from a company offering such services is that the platform has the scale and will remain online under the, the traffic load, which will then enable you to do something about it, right? Because if you don't have that platform and you're just overloaded and you can even access your server, then it's done. Um, so that's, that's what you can, I guess, buy from providers. 
In terms of mitigation, it's all about configuring, keeping an eye on the traffic and fine tuning the rules against these type of attacks. How often do people actually, how often do people actually pay ransoms? Um, unfortunately, more often than I'd like. Um, my first advice if you ever receive a ransom is ignore it. Don't even acknowledge it. Um, a lot of companies don't pay them, but they respond and then they look for help. The second you respond, the attacker knows you've read it and they've got a winning chance overview because they know you've read it, they know you're scared and they know that they can trigger a, a small attempt and, and, and they're well, whoever is being attacked is looking for that sign. Um, if you ignore it, I would say good chances is they will just move on to the next because they don't even know if, you're, if they're being looked out for, okay? Um, we have had a few cases where companies have paid. That's the worst thing to do because they will just come back again. Maybe the following year, but then incentivize them to do it across other, other websites. Any more? got time for one more question. Anyone's got one? No, we're all done. Right, well, one, just... There's one oh, over there. Is it? Uh, right, sorry, missed you, missed you. Uh, I detossed you out. Uh, other than obviously running Cloudflare, what, what would you say is the like number one thing that um, I as a service administrator should be like, keeping an eye out on uh, to know that I'm safe? And right, so... <clears throat> My advice is make sure you have the appropriate tools in-house that give you full visibility on what's happening on the network, even below, if you're running a web server, for example. Most people just focus on HTTP, and they have, you know, amount of bandwidth, they have number of requests, etc. Try and get all the tools in place to be able to get, I wouldn't say real-time data, but pretty good ability to see what's going on below that as well and being able to get that pretty fast and drill down as needed. Because if you have the visibility and you understand what's going on, you're going to save a lot of time uh, fixing the problem. If something happens and you don't have the tools to look at your traffic, you're going to be spending a day trying to get those tools in place, and you're going to have lost a lot of business, essentially. And Cloudflare comes, or whoever, definitely comes after that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you one more much. round of applause for Michael.